to Stand By Us 2021, an online forum exploring the intersections of multi-gender attraction. Whether you identify as bi, pan, queer, questioning, or any other label, or no label at all, we're delighted to have you here with us. We're coming to you from many different traditional lands of First Nations peoples, such as... Ghana land of the Adelaide Plains, South Australia. Wairarung land, Nam, Melbourne, Victoria. Gadigal land in the Eora Nation. Larrakia saltwater people's land in Larrakia country, Darwin, Northern Territory. From Kulin Nation, Bolin Bolin land, now called Bulin, a suburb of Melbourne in Victoria. Bulu on Wajak, Noongar, Buja, Perth, WA. I'm standing on the land of the Mumarimana people of the Palawa Nation in Lutruwita, Tasmania. I'm on Mijibul Arakul country in the Bunjalung Nation, Northern Rivers, New South Wales. While you're up on Wajak Noongar Buja. The Bogomata land of the Durag Nation, Bowen Mountain, New South Wales. Hello to you, wherever you are, across Australia or around the world. All land in Australia is Aboriginal land and always will be. The land was never ceded and no treaty has ever been signed. We humbly and gratefully pay our respects to the Indigenous Elders of the past, the present and those yet to emerge. We also acknowledge Indigenous LGBTIQA plus people who have lived here since long before European colonisation. Reconciliation is an ongoing process and one that all of us need to contribute to and take responsibility for. We'd like to send out a very special welcome to any First Nations people who are joining us today. Stand By Us is all about celebrating by plus people, elevating by plus voices, and bringing an amazing community together. This is a discrimination free space. So please don't say anything offensive about any group of people. This is a harassment free space. If someone makes you feel uncomfortable, please contact one of the organizers. When you engage with other people at this event, please be respectful. You can find guidelines about this on our website. Some events might talk about difficult, upsetting or triggering topics. So please keep a tab on your mental health. If you feel anxious or overwhelmed, we encourage you to take some time out and make use of some of your personal coping mechanisms. Things that might work for you are mindful breathing, grounding yourself, comfort items, or something to eat. If you need urgent support, we recommend contacting a support line such as QLife, Lifeline, Kids Helpline or Rainbow Door. Most of all, we want you to know you are not alone. We're a big, bright, diverse community and we're glad you're a part of it. Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Bye five! Bye five. Bye five. Bye five. Wow, that was so cute. <laughs> so fun. Um, thank you all so much for being here. It's really nice to have such a, a large group of people, even though I cannot see you. I'm sure that you look really beautiful. Uh, and happy Bi Plus Visibility Day for yesterday. Uh, as much as I wish that we could all be in person together, uh, I think it's really wonderful that we get to be with so many people from all over so-called Australia on different lands um, and I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present of the land on which I'm broadcasting from which is the Wurundjeri Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and as we speak about you know gender and sexuality and we share this space in storytelling recognizing the the long and beautiful history that exists on this land um, that we are all really lucky to to be present for. So thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Navo Zissin. I use they them pronouns. I'm a, an author, an educator and an activist and I run workshops in schools and workplaces around trans identity and training. 
I'm really excited to introduce our panel. And what I'm most excited about is that we are all of, uh, you know, very unique and different experiences and intersections, but also this isn't a token panel <laughs> with one uh, by non-binary person representing an entire community. So I'm really excited for us to actually be here with our peers and to be able to have a conversation about what our lives look like with one another in a way that hopefully feels really joyful for us as well. Uh, so first I want to introduce Navi Karan, who is a, a beautiful friend of mine and who I love very deeply uh, and is also an all-round goddess, community facilitator, writer, theatre producer and choreographer from India based in Nianjin. Their work creates platforms for accessible and safe storytelling for identities of various intersections and communities. They have sold out theatre productions, uh, People of Colours and a new work as well, Brown Church, uh, they're incredibly amazing. You should follow everything that they do online. Um, her work is, there aren't words in the English language because it's the colonizer's tongue, but really it is beyond. And um, the thirst traps are also a really good time. So highly recommend. Uh, Liesl Hughes uh, <laughs> is a self-confessed data nerd, educator, activist, neurodivergent, and proudly queer. Liesl is a cloud solution architect at Microsoft and a lead team member of the global LGBTQI plus employees and allies at Microsoft Network in Australia. Liesl runs a number of Perth-based queer and polyam groups and is a past member of the Women in ITWA DNI subcommittee. There's so many good ideas that are going to come out from Liesl. I'm warning you now. <laughs> They are not having a bar of anyone's crap around binarism and <laughs> transphobia, and it's going to be <laughs> a real good time. Amber Loomis is a trans non-binary bi plus advocate with experience in community organizing and community-based research. Amber currently holds the post of policy and research coordinator at LGBTIQ plus Health Australia and has previously worked in sexual assault and sexual harassment prevention response in universities. It sounds like they do a lot of work <laughs> um, and are probably overworked. We can talk about that throughout the panel at some point. Um, Amber's family is from the Sami diaspora and they are currently learning North and South Sami languages as a form of reconnection. I'm so excited to be with you all here. And I want to launch us off with a question that I think we actually don't get asked very often, which is that, you know, our identities are often distilled to words like non-binary or genderqueer, but we know that each and every one of us experience our gender really differently and really uniquely. So I'd love to actually offer the opportunity for us to talk a little bit about what our genders are and how do we experience them. I know that's a really hard question, so feel free to say like nonsensical things that won't make sense to anyone else. I think that's a really big part <laughs> of, of that. Um, if anyone feels like they want to to launch right in, please go for it. Go on, I'll jump in then. <laughs> um, anyone on the call has any idea, then please tell me, because I have no idea at all. Um, it, it's, it's a, I don't know, it, it might be something we just agonize over too much and just put too much thought into it and end up without an answer. I, I honestly don't know what it means to me. It's just this weird ephemeral thing that people talk about. I'm like, okay, I don't really get that, but I guess so maybe that's cool for you. Um, so yeah, that's, there you go. Random answer of the day to begin with. Um, yeah, it's a very, very strange nebulous concept that I really just can't put into words. It's just, Ease, I suppose. I can go next. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm on Jagara and Turbo Country, also known as Mianjin, or Brisbane. Um, thanks, Neville. Um, love you and love your work too. Um, I recently wrote this piece of poem that kind of goes as if men are from Mars and women are from Venus, then I'm the genders of the entire solar system and beyond, as seen through my mother's eyes. And so my, I see gender as a way of being and it's greatly attached to my spirituality and my 
I suppose, roles that I play in the community, um, predominantly exploring roles of healing. Um, and I find that I often exist in such levels of deep multiplicities and the one orienting factor has always been my mother and the way she existed from what I know and what I can remember. And I quite enjoy having such a complex understanding of my being and existing. And so that's my gender. It's a very beginning words of my poem. <laughs> so beautiful thank you so much I love that and I and I love hearing about this stuff because I think we we actually lose quite a lot when all we use is that kind of language and I think we do it so that cis people will understand us or at least pretend to understand us but I think there's something really beautiful in actually being able to sit in this space and talk about what our relationships to gender are in their confusing multiplicity because even Liesl you saying like I don't know if anyone else does let me know I think there are so many people who would relate to that and I think there are so many people who relate to that experience of being an entire galaxy as well um, and that's so beautiful Amber did you want to speak to to yours absolutely I um, first want to say that I am calling in from the lands of the Watamadogu clan of the Dark Nation and pay my respect to elders past and present um, I love this question and I love the answers that have been given so, so far. I think that um, this is a question I've, I've really struggled with in my life. And um, I've, for, for so long, I've constrained myself to other people's definitions or societal expectations. And when I found language around non-binary, I, I thought that that fit me very well. And in some ways it does, but it's also so much more complex than that, because I also realized that um, by, in some ways, limiting myself to non-binary, I'm falling into that trap again of constraining myself. And there are so many incredible, incredible ways to be non-binary. And I love I love um, the idea of gender as a galaxy and a way of being. And that when I think about my gender as, um, as, as being a way for me to let go of these expectations and my gender being a feeling that I can just be who I am, then I can see that my, my sense of self has radically shifted um, and I, I have been able to find so much more self-worth when I've been able to define myself on my own terms and not been limited to um, westernized language or westernized constructs. Um, and also sometimes I don't know what my gender is. So Liesl, yeah, I love that. <laughs> oh, I love that so much, Amber. And I love how much you spoke to the expansiveness of opportunity that comes from not even just the language, but the embodiment. Like, I think something I really enjoyed about what Liesl said when we were planning this panel is like how much they don't really like the term non-binary because it's always relative to something in which they don't want to be defined by, which I think is so interesting. And, and while I still really like that term, I do recognize how limited it is when we don't allow ourselves to exist way outside of that. And I think, you know, part of being non-binary which we are going to be discussing more is like leaning into the uncertainty leaning into the not knowing leaning into those gray areas and I've been thinking so much about my gender through lockdown especially because I've been in lockdown for my whole life it seems <laughs> and I think it's really interesting grappling with like what is my gender when it's actually no longer relevant uh, relative to other people when I'm not being constantly misgendered what is my gender when it is relative to the trees and to the cockatoos and to the river like what what does it look like what does it feel like what does it mean to make tea as a trans person or to take a bath as a trans person when it's not just constantly up against this like coercive binary that I'm living in and and you know and and living through lockdown and being like wow I haven't mis been misgendered in like six months have I ever had that experience any other time you know um which I think is really fascinating and the ways that I describe my gender is often like I am equal parts mom dad 
grandpa, baby, <laughs> like all of these things are just true for me always. Um, and I guess like furthering from that kind of expansive, uh, opportunistic, I think, way of looking at, at gender and, and multi-genders, I'm really interested in, you know, I think existing outside of a gendered binary can be such a disruption in so many ways. And often we're represented that disruption through tragedy or other narratives, you know, that like there's something wrong with us or um, it must be so hard to live outside of these kind of societal systems. But what I'm way more interested in is like, what for you is exciting, joyful and brilliant about living outside of the binary? Like what are the opportunities that you feel like you are presented with being able to live outside of them? Do you wanna launch us off, Amber? I do, yeah. I think what's exciting for me is that there are an infinite number of possibilities and there's no right or wrong. And I love that I can try things out and you know if it fits and I want to keep it that's great and if it doesn't then I can let go of it and not being constrained by by those norms and I love that we can challenge things in in our being and to me that there's a lot of power in that and I find that incredibly exciting. Yeah. Navi Karan, you wanna? I think, please call me Navi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, I think one, it is such a huge privilege to be able to sit on Zoom and have this conversation. Um, even for me, um, last week I was at immigration um, doing a part of my visa process and like, you know, no one wants to know if you, what your gender is or what your sexuality is when you walk into the CBD immigration because they do treat you like dirt. Um, and, and that's still an experience that I have as someone with quite a lot of privilege in comparison to the people from where I come from, you know, um, in the third world. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that um, the roots of gender um, come from such significant spaces of colonization, violence, and genocide. Um, and to have those conversations without acknowledging it is almost a disservice to the communities and I guess cultures where gender hasn't existed, where non-binaryness has always been not even a category, you know? Um, which brings me to my next point. I think people, I think we don't realize that we are such settled bodies or bodies that often are driven towards being settled, you know, if driven through capitalism, if we can have the best thing, we would go ahead and buy it in exchange for money. And that leaves very little room for play and exploration um, where we try and deeply investigate what truly really makes us happy. You know, if we had to throw away gender as a category, then we would automatically be such happier people, regardless of who you are, regardless of where we come from, because if anything, gender limits us, right? And we know that. Um, but I think often when I talk to people about gender, I often challenge them to explore what being happy means. And then, I mean, you know, we've had this huge mo movement in the last few years where a lot of cis people have been, or like people identifying as cis using their pronouns, you know, because if they say they make sense to them, but they don't identify as non-binary, that whole thing doesn't make sense because what they're saying is they found a way of self-expression, you know? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think you touched on so many 
so many points that we could extract for the next hour and a half very easily. Like, I think um, I really want to ruminate for a moment in what you said and also what was said in the chat about um, the privilege to really explore those options and to sit in that space when you're yeah, worried about migration status, when you're um, worried about where your next paycheck is going to come from and that being able to like breathe into those spaces and to learn about these things also comes with a sense of, of privilege as well to hold space for those conversations. Especially in a pandemic too. Like nobody in India gives a fuck <laughs> you know, about having this conversation when you know people are literally losing their means of living by the hour you know um and i think we have so much work to do in order to bridge the gap but in ways that is led by those people and communities yeah. um, add another point like you know when we think of like a lot of traditional in quotes um, trans communities in india a lot of people due to colonization again have predominantly engaged in sex work and begging and a few different rituals here and there but that what that has meant is that they have permanently been created as outcasts or you know deemed as outcasts and they never have opportunities to have these conversations and i guess just just another point of like how useless it feels to talk about gender and at the same time how important it is yeah i feel the same way about pronouns right like i think there is such an emphasis on pronouns right now and i say that as someone who <laughs> wrote a book about pronouns this year um, but i often say in my training like i don't actually think at the end of the day that a trans person sleeping rough cares what pronouns you use when you're handing them keys to stable housing or to access to healthcare or you know and I think the nuance and the and the the space between those certainties and those answers is a really important place to dance for all of us um, and to breathe into and what I really loved as well Navi about what you were saying with regard to the liberation that I think trans and gender diverse people offer cis people like and that is very much my approach in my work is like I don't want it to be an us and them kind of idea of like oh it must be so hard to be to feel uncomfortable in your body or it must be so hard to have the world expect things of you that you can't deliver and I'm like babes that is a universal experience <laughs> like cis people aren't just like super comfy in their bodies like we live in a world that profits off our self-doubt so how can we universalize that conversation and understand that the gender binary in which has been created through western colonial means is inherently oppressive to everyone like some people are better at conforming to it than others, but that doesn't mean that it's like liberation. And I think that's the hard thing about white feminism. Sometimes it's like, I want you to understand that trans liberation is the liberation of all of us. It is the liberation of women from misogyny. It, it, you know, like it stretches so much further. So yeah, thank you so much for, for touching on that. Liesl, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well about this conversation. Oh my God, like that's the next hour, right? <laughs> So please mute me and shut me up after 20 minutes. Um, wow, so much to unpack there. Um, I guess what, what, what springs to mind really is more, or, uh, I guess, sort of around a journey story um, and uh, where I still have no idea where I'm going, um, but that's okay, right? That's, that's kind of cool. Um, and I think it's picking up some of the threads that you've just said there, that, that you know, when you start to look at things and you start to dig and dig and pull on all the threads, it's incredible where you end up. Um, that exactly what was just said there. That that you know, you first start thinking about, oh, you know, I'm not really a boy. I guess I'm a girl. Oh, hang on, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that? And you end up digging all the way down, and then you and yeah, you get through into the whole um, the pieces we talked around around colonialism, around the systems that we live within, around that the system actually yeah, impacts everyone. Um, and um, yeah, then you, you start to unpack the words and the labels. And I think someone just popped a comment up in the chat there around, you know, our language is, is probably not serving us very well. And this is a theme that I'm, I'm digging around with in my own head at the moment. Um, that 
is the, the 50, 60, 70 year old language that we use. It's like currently any use anymore? Is it is that about time that that went and we found the next model? I don't know. Um, so it, it just runs so deep um, and so quickly. And yet so much of the world never even gets the chance to explore that. And that's a, that's a real gift. It, it sits like exactly like I really said though, it, it sits on a huge amount of privilege to have to, the luxury to actually be able to do that and to look at that. Um, but um, I do think it's very much a gift that we get we get the chance to just really look into these things and say, well, you know, pull back the curtain. Um, so I think that's one of the things I've, I've it's a struggle um, and it's a constant kind of 3 a.m. staring at the ceiling. Now what is my brain turned up for me? Thanks, brain. Will you please shut up? I want to go back to sleep. But it's also such a beautiful thing to be able to have that space to just wander in and, and find who you really are in that and how the rest of the world just, it's just a bit strange really, isn't it? And I don't want to be the, the typical nerd on the call, right? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, I'm going to bring it up anyway. Um, uh, yeah, the, the definitive like trans experience movie, right? That's been like flying under the radar for 20 years, but we all knew the whole matrixy thing, right? It just echoes so much to me. It's like, they are not ready to be free and they will quite happily turn you in, but they all need freeing kind of thing. It's really strange, the metaphors that run through that um, when you put that lens on it. Um, so yeah, that's that's some picking up some of the threads of the other people that probably say a little bit more eloquently than me. No, I think that was so beautiful. And I love that like abundance mindset and that rather than the sort of scarcity mindset that we're often forced into because of capitalism and because of model minority complexes and respectability complexes, right? Like this idea that we can all be liberated by these mentalities. And, and I love, I feel like it's really changed my approach to my own transness, you know, is like, this is a gift, this is divinity, this is connection with my ancestries across all of their experiences. Like, and that is what, you know, kind of pre-colonial understandings of gender have been in so many different cultures is like spiritual connections that bypass these div like dividing lines, you know, and, and that in my own culture, we have like six or seven different kinds of gender represented of which I was never privy to because no one ever talks about it, but that there is divinity in that and there is sacredness in that. And I just don't think I wake up any day anymore being like, oh, I wish I wasn't trans. Like every single day, I'm like so grateful that I have been presented with that insight and with that wisdom for my own self and my own relationship and how much permission that gives other people as well. Um, and I guess on that, I'm really interested in, you know, I think uh, we talk a lot about kind of intra-community policing and gatekeeping and, you know, what that sort of looks like and whether someone is trans enough or bi enough or whatever. And I think that's a conversation that happens a lot and I'm, I'm very happy to, to talk about it here. But what I'm also really interested in is like the ways that we actually police ourselves um, and make, I guess, like prisons of our own mind even, you know, like imposter syndrome, how we uh, don't feel like spaces are right for us. Um, and I guess I'm interested in what that process has been like for each of you and, and giving yourself permission, I guess, like giving yourself permission to that divinity and um, what the process of like accessing that has been despite all of the other narratives. Navi, do you, do you wanna jump in with that one? No, I'm keen to hear people's opinion first. Cool, no worries. Amber, do you want to take us away? Trying to find the unmute. Um, yeah, I think that, wow. Well, um, I think that the way I have navigated all of that has changed dramatically over, over my life. And I'm so glad, Navi, that you, you raised that this is such a privileged conversation for us to be having because I was thinking about that so much in preparation for this panel. And even this morning, um, you know, in the shower, I was thinking about, oh, I haven't always even thought about my gender, you know, when, when at the times in my life where safety was my number one concern, I never thought about anything to do with gender or navigating any of those complexities. And I still have moments where that's the case. And, you know, when we're living in a society that's so focused on 
grinding us to the bone through, you know, capitalism and the ongoing impacts of colonization, navigating uh, each of those, each of those dynamics and the way that I, I think about myself and create limitations for myself have all changed. And so I think that I'm constantly reminding myself that I don't have to be limited by conversations or, or constructions or standards that other people have set. You know, I think that there's very much a narrative around this is what it means to be non-binary or, you know, fill in the blank with whatever other language. And it's okay that I don't always fit that. And it's okay that my relationship to that changes and reminding myself consistently that fluidity is okay. And I think that we've got such, such a culture of wanting certainty. And I do think that comes a lot from, from colonialism and, and it's okay to push against that. And so I do have to remind myself of that all the time and being in conversations like this and connecting with community where um, we can remind each other of that is really affirming and really important to me. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks, Amber. Liesl, did you have some, some thoughts on that? I'm um, chasing my rabbits as ever. Uh, I love my brain. There's, there's 15 thoughts go flying off all over the place and trying to hold on to them. Like, what was the original question again? Um, yeah, what was the original question again? Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry, the original question was like the ways in which we um, police ourselves and yeah, okay. imposter syndrome and how we've given ourselves permission, essentially. Yeah, that, that's, that is a, a really interesting one. Um, yeah, because there are so many set paths and set narratives and the, the whole notion of the, the good label, doesn't matter what the label is, you know, there's a good way of doing it and a bad way of doing it. And the whole respectability thing plays into it saying, you know, we're good ones of those and they're the bad ones. So, you know, every community subdivides into othering half of them so that the rest of them can step up the ladder, you know. And, and it just... I, you struggle with it so much. Um, and I think looking for all of my pieces as pieces started to slot into place or you, know, you, you find the, the corners in the jigsaw box first and then you find that piece that you didn't even know you needed down the back of the sofa kind of thing, you know, and, and the puzzle starts to, to, to come together and you, know, you, you think you're actually looking at a, a, a landscape and it turns into a kitten or something, you know, jigsaws are strange things. Um, the more you kind of realize that, that regardless of where you sit in whichever identity, it doesn't, I don't think it really matters which one, those narratives actually are, are really damaging, whether it's, a, the, the, yeah, like you said earlier, the straight community or the, the queer community or the LGBT community, which I do differentiate between the two. Um, yeah, and so undoing those um, when you don't even realize they've been put in is a huge, huge amount of work. And as each little piece falls away and you find more and more of, of what you really are and who you really are in the middle of all of that, that piles of rocks that have been chopped on top of you, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to, to get to. Uh, but yeah, it's quite sad that there is all of that, that sort of, sort of um, construction around it that we're told you have to be like this. If you're going to transition, you must do this, this, and this. And if you're going to, you know, um, and that ties back, like I said, about the whole language model, that I am X, therefore I do Y. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so, yeah, the, I think the narratives are the things that, that, for me, drive that whole doubt. And when you actually unpack those stories and say, I don't want to read that book anymore, um, that does tend to start falling away a lot. Yeah, I really like that, the not reading the book anymore or being open to what the jigsaw might um, represent. And I definitely think I've gotten to that point as well, like when I am kind of watching people policing each other or um, saying what it, what it means to be trans, like what is trans and what is bi and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I think when you get a, a group of quite traumatised people together, we enact our trauma on one another and we rub up against each other in the wrong ways. And I've started to see that as a reflection of someone else a lot more than it is of my own 
identity and you know we were talking about this in our planning session of like what does it mean to not be a gatekeeper but someone who goes and gets the key cut um, and wants to let in as, as many people as who want to be part of things you know and community building and and mutual aid and you know like what are these sorts of ideas what do they actually mean in our bodies and in the ways that we interact with other people and I think especially as I get older as well and I watch more of that discourse play out on social media and I'm just like my gender isn't here my gender isn't in this thread on Facebook. My gender isn't in this argument on passing privilege versus this, you know, like I'm just trans and I'm, and I'm just bi and I'm just like all of these things and I don't need permission from anyone else to tell me that I am. Um, yeah, Navi, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts if you want to. Yeah, um, this question is so complex because the policing of myself is, often driven by how people of color are policed in this country, um, predominantly black and indigenous people. Um, so there's so many ways of answering this. Um, for me, compassion plays a really powerful um, role. So when I leave the house, I have to genuinely prepare myself to not give a fuck. And the, I guess the framework I use is um, I'm not ready and they're not ready. So what that means for me is, um, you know, so when I was, I was, I just flew back from Tasmania last night, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, I, I could give myself some days off from work and I usually get asked where I'm from by a lot of people when I go traveling or like, I mean, even in Brisbane, when I take a walk, but people in Tasmania were not prepared to see a brown person in general to the point that people just stared and wouldn't even come to a place of asking questions, um, let alone being asked where I'm from. Um, what that tells me is that people are not ready to have that conversation. And I have that compassion for them because a lot of, especially white people are so deeply colonized that they do not themselves can give themselves permission to have these conversations, right? And therefore at the same time, I'm not ready to have these conversations with these people because ideally I would like to hold every single person by my torso and love them to the point that I can support them understand the multiplicities in which we exist and the love that we need to be sharing with each other. But that's impossible. That is so incredibly unsustainable for me, given that I could have to leave this country anytime. So like even the sole act of investing in the politics of this country of the day to day is extremely taxing. And so what brings me peace is that I know that people don't have to accept me be solely because I don't have the capacity to accept them and you know nurture them I have a lot a huge part of me requiring to I find the word policing myself so incredibly I guess it's such a potent term um, the act of de-policing myself came through needing to sit through a lot of grief and trying to find I guess, meaning in what that grief meant, because like, you know, I've been through something, like, you know, I guess we've been through things, but to sit with those experiences and find the humanity of everything has taken a lot of work. Mm. I think every single human is cap capable of that. But I think a lot of people, and especially a lot of white people, um, regardless of the agenda, have to sit through that discomfort of realizing, um, I think, if you have, again, it, it again goes back to, we have so much work to do. You know, this conversation keeps feeling so surreal because it's like, why are we here having this conversation when there's real things happening, you know, to trans people, to queer people, yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, you know, I really do believe in like the dismantling of the ways in which those systems have 
settled in our own bodies as a part of dismantling those systems outside of them, right? Like understanding the ways that we police ourselves, that we police each other, and then how we can move outside of a policing state. Like there is a reason why that language is also really important to use, I think, and recognizing that punitive um, way of approaching community as not being community at all. And how will we actually imagine futures or utopias or something beyond that if we you know, can't unpack how those systems have settled within ourselves. And obviously that's a really difficult thing to do when you still live in those systems and when people are disproportionately impacted by them, right? Like what it means for me to grapple with that might look really different from other people on the panel as well. And I think that that's um, a really important thing to, to sit with and consider. Um, moving away from this a little bit, but still on the kind of um, deconstructing, reconstructing space, uh, something that we spoke about quite a bit in our um, in our planning session was like problematizing the linear transition uh, and how much non-binary people do that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, binary people also have their own experiences within that. But uh, I personally have so many big feelings about like before and afters and the really strange overlap between like binary trans existence and like diet culture, <laughs> like these sort of like before and after side-by-side -side photos. Like I, I post photos like that sometimes, but I use the terms like then and now, because I think when we create this like end point, when we are still living our life, we're like not really allowing ourselves to grow and evolve further beyond that point. And for me, you know, like I came out as a binary trans man and then transitioned and then experienced heaps of dysphoria being read as a man which was not something I ever anticipated and then I had to just like completely pull everything up from the roots again and that was so unsettling for me so I'm really interested in like how do we as people live outside of those scripts you know how do we um how do we problematize this idea of certainty and Amber I loved what you said with regard to like certainty being so wrapped in colonization and white supremacy and, and just like whiteness and also toxic masculinity and capitalism, you know, like what is it about certainty that people love so much? And um, yeah, how have we problematized those, um, those linearities? Um, Liesl, I would also love uh, for you to jump in with your metaphor at any point, if you would like to bring it into the space, because it's such a good one. <laughs> I was waiting for Amber to go first, but I'll jump in. Um, hey, that was a week ago, right? I've moved on since then. <laughs> I got bigger, amazing, more metaphors dreamt up in my head. Oh, God, I love the way that things just come out of nowhere. Um, I'm going to pick up on a couple of points and, and maybe get a little bit close to the edge and a little bit contentious uh, that, that, that you just said there. Um, I, I really struggle with the whole notion of like binary trans. It, it it sometimes um, it feels like and I'm not going to express this very well, so I'll predicate this with a whole bunch of apologies up front and uh, <laughs> backpedaling. Um, it's almost like there's a, a a level of like superiority, like oh we've evolved past that thing, which doesn't feel right to me. Um, I, we've already said how the way our, our, our society and the constructs that have been built around us for our society by certain groups um, impact a large number of people and don't really benefit anyone, or actually, sorry, they benefit everyone, but they also impact everyone, uh, benefit some, impact everyone. Um, and I feel that, that that binary trans notion is yet another one of those narratives that just feels uncomfortable to me. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some people's journeys look like that. Some people's journeys have a beginning and a middle and an end, and, and it's great, and they, they move on, and that's fantastic for them. And others are not really, you know, they're, they're, they're not linear, not defined like that, and that's fantastic as well. So that's a, a, an issue that I, I don't, doesn't sit comfortable with me anymore. And it used to. It used to be really kind of like, you know, oh, them, us kind of thing. But then you, you kind of look at it, and you just created yet another division. So... I think it's really uh, important to acknowledge that 
everyone is just finding their way to, the, to an end that works for them um, that may, may move later. Um, that didn't answer the question, but that was the point I wanted to pick up on there. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. I, I totally get it. And I really, yeah, I like, I really like that discourse about how we're just creating new versions of them and us. Cause I have felt that a lot in like AFAB, AMAB discussion spaces. And I know that like, um, I'm sure we've, we've all had those kinds of experiences at different points because I think, you know, sitting with positionality and privilege is so important, but whenever we like do these broad brush strokes about what an experience is like because you're AFAB or because you're AMAB, especially forgetting that non-binary people exist, that some of us have transitioned or haven't transitioned, like the way I move in, in the world as like a femme person with facial hair who was assigned female at birth is just like not really able to be captured in that binary again you know or this like trans femme trans mask dichotomy as well I think is really interesting um yeah Amber I'd love to hear your thoughts on this problematizing linear transitions I linearity just doesn't make sense to me um you know when I think about my life and my experiences and the way that I move through the world it's, you know, it's zigzags and it's curves and it loops and it intersects with other people and systems and the world around me. And so uh, a before and an after, just like, it, it's something that doesn't make sense in my mind. Um, and I know that there are people who have comfort in that. And I think for people who do have comfort in that, that's important um, because that's, you know, their way of, of being their authentic selves. Um, but but for me and myself, it, I don't know what before and after means. Um, and yeah, I, I, I could uh, disentangle it or try to disentangle it in my mind. And but I bring all parts of myself to everything and I can't separate out um, a life before a transition or I it's very complex. So mm, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> no, it's great. I think the whole point of the question is uncertainty, right? So there is no answer. <laughs> I think that's kind of the best part of it. Um, Navi, did you have some thoughts? Um, are we prepared to, you know, investigate? I think, I think we are so obsessed with labels and I think work culture um, and I guess capitalism has really driven us to be obsessed with labeling life phases you know so the like are we prepared to explore what the extent of the word transition is you know um and what access do people have to have these conversations and to change things i cannot i cannot access a lot of like you know when we look at a western medical perspective of like what does transition look like it often looks like hormones and surgery can populations um, like, you know, like even with Australia having potentially the best healthcare in the world, there are still many people <laughs> in this colony that cannot access healthcare for a lot of things. Um, I think, I think it goes back to like investigating who you really want to be and exploring and exploring and exploring until you find that. Um, there's a question um, um, by Chris on the Q&A that says, um, as I've gone on the journey of my bi-identity, I've sometimes felt that my personality or even my entire being is in the danger of falling apart. How do you hold it together? Like my response is, so what if it falls apart? That is a part of your journey still like, Again, like, you know, like I said earlier, we are so used to being settled and comfortable that anything that brings us pain and discomfort for the mere sake of evolving into better people that makes that you know, has gives us access to feeling happier, we immediately consider that as a negative, you know? Um, maybe your personality is meant to fall apart. I think that, you know, I found, I found my maker's plan when my life fell apart and then I had to piece it back together from what I could find. And so 
I think I think transitioning for me the way I've always thought about it has always been okay if I want boobs how can I have access to boobs and what purpose does boobs for example and this is a very extreme example still do they serve you know are we looking at looking a certain way are we looking at how I want to engage with my body sexually or physically or spiritually um are we talking about access to the fashion industry, to diet culture, um, to health and fitness? I think we need to accept that none of this is going to be comfortable. And that is potentially a way ahead to find that, you know, like, like you're right, there is no answer, but, but the answer, I, I guess only because it's so different drastically to every single person. Oh, I could not have resonated with what you said more. Like I felt it in the depths of myself. Um, oh, I think that, yeah, I think there's been like so much conflation of comfort and safety, right? I think when we call about, like talk about safe spaces or like feeling safe, it's like, are you talking about safety or are you talking about comfort? Because I couldn't agree with you more. I think, you know, the biggest growth, the most development I've ever had as a person is when everything fell apart and when I was like completely uncomfortable um, fortunately I wasn't unsafe so there was a lot of like growth that could still take place in that space but yeah I think once I stopped relying on like when I get to this point in my transition I'll stop experiencing dysphoria or when I reach this things will be easier and when I started just as cliche as it sounds trusting in the fact that the only constant is change and that I just that's actually the only thing I can really trust in and really believe in because it is constantly moving and flowing. I didn't feel the need to control things anymore. And I just recognized that it comes in waves, just like mental health, you know, like happiness is not an end point. It's like a constant evolution and like you will have moments of it, but you won't know how to recognize happiness if you don't have sadness as well like you know there is this contrast there is the light and shade there's the shadow side of everything we go through and um yeah I, that was just so beautifully said Navi thank you so much I feel gifted by by those insights yeah if anyone else wants to jump in as well like please feel free to comment on what each other are saying <laughs> and I just totally lost those threads so yet again oh my god I should be writing notes as I go um <laughs> Growth, yes. Um, you know, it, it doesn't happen when you're comfort, uh, you know, when you're comfortable. It, it only happens outside, right? You, if you're in a comfort zone, you're never going anywhere. And that's, that's not just in reflecting on yourself, that's anything. You know, you, you want to acquire a new skill or something, you, you've got to start it and be pretty terrible at it and feel pretty bad about it while you perfect it, right? So growth happens in those spaces outside in the uncomfortable area but you're right about safety as well though you know there's a massive difference between the two of them um and i think the other piece that, that was just mentioned that just really i mean you know so many people you, you talk to and they don't get your your journey metaphor kind of thing and then you hear someone reflect it back and you just kind of go oh my god i'm going to start crying now um so the image that that always sort of went through my head around the whole thing of, of what is it you're actually up to here was um, I kind of described it as, as taking your entire life and, and piling up in a big heap and setting fire to the lot um, and you know you, you don't know what's going to come out of the end of it but you know the next morning it's all kind of burnt down you can rake over the ashes and then you start to find the gems that are inside there that, that have come from that 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 is so destructive you know to just just taking what, what you've been told is you for years, decades, whatever, and, and ripping it apart and just really finding what's inside there. And, and so, you know, picking those little, those little gems up out of your, 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 your ashes and, and carrying those with you, that was the important stuff. The rest of it was, was just, you know, it, it didn't really matter. And so that's the, the one little movie that, that sort of sums up that piece for me and that that's exactly what or, or that's what I heard what, what Navi was saying there as well um, around that you have to be outside and you have to pull things apart to, to be able to rebuild I need a little lie down now <laughs> 
there's something here for me about deep interrogation of myself and the world around me. And even though the way that, even though sometimes the way I understand myself and how that changes doesn't matter, what does matter is my values and that's what grounds me and I can figure everything else out or maybe I won't and that's fine and those things can can both be true at the same time because there are multiple truths and we can hold that multiplicity and that complexity and so that that growth is just an image that's really resonating with me right now so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I think there's also something here, right, about um, sitting in discomfort and grappling with your ego outside of these narratives that also really contributes to like anti-oppressive practice and like true and deep and meaningful allyship. Because I think if someone is not able to be uncomfortable or does it or has a real like aversion to discomfort, I just don't think that they could really be a very good ally because I actually think that a really huge part of allyship and recognizing your positionality is putting your ego to the side and recognizing that the ideals and the like images that you have around yourself as like a good person or like an oppressed minority and not capable of harm outside of yourself, um, I think really contributes to like quite a lot of toxic notions and to be able to unpack that and sit in the discomfort of like recognizing privilege, recognizing your complicity in systems of oppression, I think is a really, it's actually quite a big value, like to actually value discomfort um, and, and actually value, yeah, that deep self-interrogation that you were talking about, Amber, that I think so many people are really afraid of and then on the other side don't have access to for whatever reason um, and that all of those things can exist at the same time right <laughs> which is such a big part of that um, complexity I, I'd be really happy to keep talking about this point if you all want to like stay in this space and I'm also happy to move on to the next question Navi did you have more thoughts that you wanted to to bring to this conversation no good Awesome. Uh, so yeah, let's let's move on because we have really so much that we could cover. And I will remind you as well that um, we have another half hour. We would love to take your questions as well. So please feel free to have a think about them, to put them in the q and um, I'm sure that you've already gotten the sense that this isn't really like a 101 pronouns conversation. So while um, we certainly could answer, what do you do if someone uses multiple pronouns or something like that? Um, I'm kind of encouraging that this isn't the space for that and that there are lots of like 101 workshops and panels that are available and, and seeing the way people are responding in the chat as well. I think we're all really enjoying going a little bit deeper and further. So um, this is an invitation and also a challenge to like, let's, let's go as deep as we can or that we want to. Uh, and on that, you know, I, I would love to ask you like, what are the questions that you wish people would ask? You know, like, I feel like we're kind of, constantly stagnated sometimes by those 101 discussions and um, I feel like we've been able to access those spaces quite beautifully in this conversation but I wonder like what are other questions that you would love to to be asked is this question for the audience or is it for us no, it's for you. <laughs> Tension is too much. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd like people to ask me how they can pay my rent and buy my groceries. Like this country makes it impossible to survive. Um, people expect labor of people of color and queer people far too much. I Every time I share something on Instagram that is not about activism or anti-racism, people actually unfollow me. Um, every time, like, you know, I I pretty much stopped using Instagram quite a lot in the last few months. And I'm trying to like have a rethink about what I want to do with my social media, predominantly because people are incredibly selfish. Um, and social media also incentivizes um, reactions. And so, um, like, 
I want people to engage with me in ways that allow for my humanity that is beyond, you know, me sharing on through all of my work really what like you know essentially my work comes down to helping support people realize the humanity of people of color across you know identities in ways that I can and um i want to change the way in which storytelling involves the entire humanity of people um and i want people to be be able to better engage with that you know oh the things i could tell you <laughs> yeah totally that really resonates for me and and just like yeah just people thinking that they know you <laughs> that they know you really well because of social media and um it's wild it's honestly wild. and at the same time putting people on pedestals like people message me saying oh you said this thing and i'm like hang on why do you think i'm perfect i probably have lesser access to resources than you to educate myself on this and you're putting me on this pedestal expecting me to be an all knowing being when really i'm quite poor and my work takes a lot of labor you know and I, this isn't my work right like yeah. social media is not my work <laughs> also you at the same time you expect me to look good by doing all of this so it's like why what is this gymnastics you're trying to play here like sit down <laughs> totally i've shared stuff where people are like what you've missed is this this and this or like you <laughs> haven't shared this this and this truth and i'm like i'm not an investigative journalist like, I'm just a person on my social media. If you want to put in the other side of it, feel free to chuck it in the comments. But, like, I don't have a responsibility to you to give, like, an unbiased, well-researched, all-rounded perspective on something. I'm just some guy who's, like, in my 20s on the internet. Like, leave me alone, you know? Like, I post memes and people are like, oh, this is, like, kind of not funny because of this. And I'm like, I'm not taking it down. You don't find it funny. You don't have to find it funny. Like, leave me alone. I'm also in lockdown, like trying to bloody give myself just whatever serotonin I can. <laughs> you know, God. Amber's got thoughts. I can see them. I can see them bubbling. I have so many thoughts. Like I'm just bursting because all this is yes, yes, yes. I've done a scrub of my social media recently. I mean, I'm there in some corners, but got rid of Instagram, got rid of Twitter um, because I just think there's this expectation that like I exist for myself. I don't owe anything to anyone else other than compassion and trying to move through the world is being the most ethical person that I can be. Um, and so <laughs> this, this extraction of stories that can come from sometimes being on social media and like the way that people try to use that to put people on, on a platform. And I, it's like messy and gives me really weird, complicated feelings. Um, so what, what do I wish people would ask? I wish that people would ask, um, how we can have more, more reciprocity in what we do. And I think that that comes for me from that idea of oftentimes there is that extraction of stories that, oh, you're this token person that ticks all these boxes. So we want you for this particular um, to, to bring in that particular viewpoint for this panel or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but I don't see a lot of how can we work together um, on whatever it might be to construct a world that's better for everyone all the way from, you know, needs to, you know, high self-actualization. Um, so I guess, I guess that's what I wish people would ask and do. Yeah, I love those conversations about reciprocity and something I was talking about on a panel the other day was like how, you know, people were asking like how to be a good ally kind of thing. And I was like, look at the resumes and the track records of every queer person or every like activist person and match it 
so we can take days off because you adding your pronouns to your email signature with all due respect is shit all like you doing a brunch and eating some rainbow cupcakes means nothing for me like the standard that we hold ourselves to as allies with our little ally badges is like so embarrassing it really is embarrassing like I look at the track records of some of the activists around me and I'm like I could be doing so much more than I am and I already feel like I'm doing as much as I can and then you see people like patting themselves on the back for not kicking their kids out of home or like for just like being so cool about it and it's like this is not the bar like the bar is to do as much as we are doing so we can take days off (laughs) <laughs> you know like so that we can have hobbies and we can like have lives outside of this stuff and not be impacted by these things every day and I say that as a white person so it's like I can't even begin to imagine what that looks like for other people you know and I think raising that that bar so much higher than it is I think would do us all quite a large service. Liesl did you want to jump in with some of your your thoughts around this as well? Done it again. It's like 15 different rabbits running around in my head as well. Oh, it's going to be a great day at work after this, I can tell you. They're going to love me in those meetings this afternoon. Um, uh, so the, 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 the allyship tokenism visibility piece, actually, um, I, I get what you're saying, and I totally understand it from one context and through one lens. On the other side, though, um, visibility is so important. Um, you know, I don't know when I get on the bus in the morning that that school kid at the back of the bus just happened to see me and that changed their life. Right? That, that getting out of bed is bloody activism, right? Walking out the front door is activism. You don't have to, to sit on panels and do stuff to be, to be um, you know, just being out in the world. And I think from... Um, I'm going to use labels that I really hate using, but, you know, labels provide context for other people. If you're talking about cis allies, that rainbow pin actually means a hell of a lot, even though they haven't engaged and they haven't written to their members of parliament and they haven't, you know, marched through the streets and whatever. Just seeing that on someone um, can be life-changing for that that person that's in a a very difficult space. Um, And so I think that, some of the things that we think are tokenistic from our point of view, from, from our, our lives, actually aren't. They're very, very important pieces. So acknowledging those, those days of significance that, you know, I don't have to do wear it purple day. Someone else will organise that. It's great. I get to eat cupcakes. Fantastic. Um, I haven't had to put the labour in to do that, to raise that piece of awareness. Um, those kinds of, of visibility events are um, shouldn't be underestimated, even though they seem very superficial from some of the challenges that we face when we have you know, legislation in, in the New South Wales uh, Parliament trying to actually erase us from existence from the school's curriculums, right? I mean, the different levels of challenge there. Um, so that, I guess that's one point that even if it appears tokenistic, it may have some benefit. But then there was the line, obviously, and the line, like you said, is, is the bar is so incredibly low, they don't have to step over it. It's, it's on the ground, right? So maybe there's a, a lifting that up a little bit as well. But I, I kind of approach that in that you have to start somewhere and everybody has to start on their unpacking and unlearning and an allyship journey, regardless of which communities they're trying to be allies to, whether it's you know, to themselves or to all. Um, and I don't, it's very difficult to not to be angry at them for not knowing what they don't know at the beginning. Um, so I think those those initiatives are a, a place to start from and to build from, um, and then moving into the other kind of more formal awareness stuff and the actual conversations and the, the, the storytelling around what our lives are actually really like when you get from the 101 level to the, you know, the level 200 and the level 300. Um, totally. And I so, mean, I, I so don't disagree with you, right? Like I think... Um, I mean, when I'm putting my workshop facilitator hat on and I'm running these 101 trans workshops and I'm like, everything you do is amazing and that rainbow pin can change someone's life because it is true, absolutely. I think it's just similar with our idea about linear transition, right? That there is an end goal that when people are like, I am an ally and it's like, 
that's not a self-appointed title. You don't get to decide that you've like done enough. I want to see your resume. I want to see the working out on the page before you got to the answer. And I think what I'm speaking to is definitely the people who pat themselves on the back or think that like we should just be so grateful that they misgendered us and then apologized, you know? And I think that's that's the thing is like, I absolutely agree. I think positive reinforcement for people who are taking those steps. And I think also this like, assimilation versus liberation like we need to have further goals to look to because otherwise we'll think we've done enough and queerness will just get co-opted by capitalism as it already is with ANZ and all of these other huge you know Qantas turning refugees away and sending them back to their you know countries of origin that are incredibly risky but then also being in our pride parades like I think that if we we don't have a hawk's eye on some of this stuff that it actually will be kind of disastrous um so I think all of those things at least from my perspective are true at once um Amber I feel like you wanted to jump in I think you you commented on exactly where my mind was going with it and I think for me also it's about it goes back to that idea of um discomfort and where are people challenging themselves to to think about the differences between discomfort and feeling unsafe. And, you know, if someone's comfort zone is wearing a badge, yeah, that has so much impact for quite a lot of people. And what else, what else is there? Like that might be comfortable, but you also want people to be challenging themselves to not move into a zone of, you know, unsafety, but, but pushing the borders on, well, borders, I don't really like that word, but pushing the the, the boxes um, and doing what they can to, to change things. Um, I don't agree. I think this country has a huge problem with sitting on the fence. And doing the bare minimum as um, an excuse for doing the work. Um, like, you know, if we look alone at the rates at which, how, like the rates of poverty in this country, when we look at the rates of domestic violence, when we look at the rates of trans young people, becoming homeless and engaging in um, self-harm and suicidal ideation. When we look at the access, lack of access of healthcare for queer people, I don't give a fuck about someone wearing a badge. You know, I shouldn't have to get out of my house and be on a bus for a child who is queer to find safety. I think it is really, I think it's a very, like I don't, I have been to a pride parade once a few years ago and it's never been safe for me since. Um, honestly, lose like, you know, like, I wonder how many times white people go into a space and realize that there is not a single person of color in the room. I have been to panels and events organized by like, you know, some really like, you know, people like Art for Australia, right? And the only other people of color in the room have been people serving us food. I don't, like, you know, even the, like I've, I've been to like queer panels where there have been stages where a person who like, you know, didn't have any guests, which made it easy for them. But if there was a person using a wheelchair, for example, they couldn't even get on the platform. Like, and these are people who call themselves queer allies, having queer people working within these organizations, right? The reason, the reason why we think, you know, um, tradies, for example, going on protests in Melbourne is such a huge radical thing is because we don't actually are comfortable by the idea of leaving our houses to protest. 
this country is too comfortable. It hurts me how much damage we incur because of how much we'd rather just stay in our comfort and wear a pin or add a filter to our Facebook profile pictures than to actually do things, you know? Um, like I absolutely understand though, like, I, like, you know, again, it goes back to the point, I get where white people are coming from, I get where, and I think other people of color as well, I, I, I think, you know, there's other people of color in these spaces as well that colonize other people of color and other queer bodies, for sure, and I get it. But I think it's far too late for us to have, you know, tried ally groups in organizations that can absolutely donate billions of dollars if they wanted to. I think you're so right. And I think that there's this huge problem where language around intersectionality and diversity and inclusion are being used by these major well, sometimes they're not even major organizations. Sometimes they're small organizations which claim to be doing the work and they know how to use the, the fancy words, but they're not actually doing the tangible things that make a difference in people's lives. Yeah, and I also wanted to touch on quickly as well, like I think I've experienced quite a pivot in my life and in my activism in the last few years from a place of like shame and guilt and feeling like I really like, have to do these things because of the privilege that I experience and into a, a really different place of like genuine joy that every moment that I enjoy my life deeply, like really deeply let myself enjoy my life. I want that experience for everyone. And that is what like fuels my activism now. It's not about like making myself feel better or like guilt or things like that. It's genuinely understanding how beautiful the world is and that everyone should be able to experience that and so um, I really recommend like having a look into some of Adrienne Marie Brown's work and pleasure activism and the ways that she also speaks about that work on podcasts because I think it's a really big pivot and I actually think that some of that shame and guilt doesn't really serve people because it becomes this like narcissistic um, kind of cycle. And, and I can even sort of see it where people are like, oh, I, I don't wanna be an activist. I can't be in this space. Um, or, you know, like we're doing all we can, but like what else is there? And, and I really understand all of that. And I think that that's really, you know, I get it. Um, and I also think that we can come from like an expansive, exciting place rather than like, oh, what else do I have to do? Like how much more am I being asked of and more like, I get to do these things, like I get to engage in these spaces if I have the, the opportunity to do so. And it's actually exciting and a, a good thing, you know, like mutual aid and community building shouldn't always feel like work um, or like it's coming at a deficit. If anything, it should like fill your life much more. I can't imagine my life without activism because it's everything that I do, it's, it's embodied in everything that I believe in and it's a part of the fabric of who I am. It's not like, it's not a pin, you know? <laughs> um, I wanna uh, quickly pivot because I think that we could, we could stay on this conversation for a really long time and I'm aware that we haven't um, yet hit our Q and A's. Uh, but one thing that, you know, we haven't actually really spoken about until right now is like bisexual identity or like multi-gender attraction and the intersection of, you know, non-binary sexuality. And I think what's really interesting is in so many kind of 101 trainings, historically, it's been like gender and sexuality are separate. They're completely different things, right? Um, and I don't want to assume that that's not true for everyone here. But for me, like, they have obviously interacted. I mean, I went from being a lesbian to a straight man to a non-binary, queer, polyamorous slut. So like, obviously those things have a relationship. Um, and, you know, Liesl and I were talking in the planning session about like, no matter what your gender or your sexuality, if you're attracted to me, you're gay, because I just like have all of the genders. <laughs> so I, yeah, I'm really interested in just like hearing um, where those intersections exist for you and like how those, um, those things interact with one another.
I can start. Um, I think I said this before, but I can't disentangle those parts of myself. They're so, so linked. And I didn't realize that until pretty recently, because I think I went through this process of first, I was interrogating my sexual romantic orientation and I felt like I had come to whatever answers that I did. And then I started thinking a lot more about my gender. And then I realized how interlinked they were. I really can't, can't disentangle the two at all. Um, and I really love that about myself. And I love um, that they, yeah, I love, I love that they're linked. Trying to find my unmute. Um, yeah, you know, we, we started off talking about labels right at the very beginning, and um, like you just said there, that that uh, you know you, you move from having this because you are that attracted to that to this because you are the same thing. Yeah, you know, you're just redefining yourself. You're still the same person, but now you're it's a different label because it, 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 it. I always I just found it like so limiting. So you know the the. The, the attraction label changes depending on your relationship to yourself. So what does that say about that label, right? Does it mean anything? Um, and I think that's where I got to the whole point and just dropped them all. And that's why queer appeals to me so much. It's like none of that gets defined. All of it gets to move. And I don't have to have the, the constraints and stories around one particular thing and how that relates to something else with a different label. It's like, great. You know, if, if those are... are a, a nice firm concepts for you and that works for you that's fantastic because I don't get to define your labels um, but for myself it was very much um, they were just so limiting um, with the 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 uh, not baggage but you know the the, the sort of connotations that come with them um, and that's why I've just landed on the whole Q piece um, yeah I think what I also really love which is like no, it's not too much information, but, you know, is like how much non-binary people give cis people permission to experiment with gender in bed. Like, I love the ideas that cis people have around like tops or bottoms or like subs or doms or whatever. And like, obviously this is different in BDSM communities and those things can be queered and whatever. But I think what I really enjoy is like sleeping with cis people who have a certain idea about what their gender is in bed and then that just like really having to change because I have so many genders and that they can't like slot me into what they think is relative to them like um and I love that because you just watch like that brain kind of break a little bit and just like go open and they're like wait I could do this or like I could do that and it's like yeah you could do whatever you want you know, as long as it's pre-negotiated, like there's no reason why that, why sex can't be play in the way that like, I think it should be, you know. And, and then you say to them at the end, ha ha, you're gay now. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's my evil, evil brattiness playing out. <laughs> I'll also answer the question. Um, I I have stopped centering my gender and my sexuality as an identity in the way I exist. And so I just feel like a very sexual auntie that wants to feed everybody and hold hands and um, set fire to buildings, um, you know? Um, yeah, and so I think and I think that's brought a lot of freedom. My simple rule has been, if I'm not gonna question a cis or a white person about something, then I'm not gonna question myself about it. So like a white person or a cis person doesn't wonder what gender they are when they're having sex with someone. I'm not gonna do that either, you know? And I think that brings a lot of freedom because I mean, one, I've already investigated it. So it's not like I'm ignorant. Um, and, is, and I'm blissful in that ignorance. But I think it kind of puts a lot of pressure off because I think as queer people, we have been put, because we've been so politicized, we have had to question various, various aspects of us con consistently and constantly and with various people. 
and in various interactions, it's like you're queer and you're buying coffee. What's your like? You know, going back to what you initially said, Neville. It's like, what is your relationship to this cafe? And you're like, how do I interact with the barista who might be cute? And you're just like, this is a lot <laughs> for seven a.m. on a Monday. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it also, um, I think that also really plays into that joyful perspective, you know, an abundance mentality of like extracting our queerness from a narrative of suffering and extracting our gender from like our oppression. And what does it mean when it's actually just in our bodies and it actually just feels good and exciting and fun and playful. Um, and I think that that's really exciting. And, and I really want to stay in this space. Like I know that there are questions in the chat about like, how to be better allies or like what is genuine inclusion and that kind of stuff. And um, I think it's a really important conversation. I know that we've challenged those things quite a lot in this conversation and maybe haven't given heaps of solutions. And I also don't want to, I actually kind of want to sit in that space. I think if you have those questions, that is a really great fuel to go and find out. I know that all of us do this work. You can, you can follow all of us on, on socials or connect with us on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, I do training specifically and like consultation for workplaces to do more genuine inclusion and not tokenism. So like um, I would be really happy to talk about that stuff in billable hours. <laughs> and I think that what's really cool about this conversation is that it's actually not about that. It's not centering allyship. It's not centering um, cis folks trying to be better, which, you know, is actually 99% of my work. Um, and I'm so excited to be on this panel not talking about that. <laughs> I really love like challenging these ideas and not solving them <laughs> because that onus is so often on us, right? It's like, well, if you want to deconstruct this thing, you have to reconstruct it. And it's like, I don't have the blueprints. Let's write them together. You know, like that's not, that's not my job. So um, I hope that's okay with everyone on the panel as well. And I would really love to give us the last few minutes to just talk to whatever we would like to speak to that has come up from this conversation, if there are any kind of last things that you would really like to, to say or mention. Um, and also if you want to plug your work, please. I got one. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk about the, um, the exact opposite side of this about, uh, we, we touched on the, 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 the expansiveness and the, 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 yeah, the world we get to play in. Um, but um, I, I guess I wanted to, to to touch on how the, the, the kind of euphoria piece and the, um, how truly uh, great it is, besides all of the, every, you know, all of the shit that we have to do with every day, um, like I said, just stepping outside the front door. Um, but, you know, those moments that just hit you and you just go, with all of that chaos and all of that difficulty and all of that everything else that's around us, it's actually pretty good. You, know, you can get those little little pieces. It's a it's the, the three a.m. dance floor surrounded by a whole bunch of queers kind of thing with yeah you know, four on the floor pounding away, and you're like, yeah, you know, that that pure euphoria piece. Um, that's something that no one ever seems to want to know about. It's always around, oh, you poor thing, and you know the polit the politics of it, and what it takes to update your, your your birth certificate or your you know the, the legal sides of it and then access to healthcare and everything must be so terrible for you but actually there's so much joy and beauty in this as well those are the kind of things that i think that get left out um and i totally agree about the whole allyship thing you know the the internet is there um use your favorite search engine and go do the work yourself um is is something that I probably don't say enough of, um, but yeah, just the joy piece, the the three a.m. dance floor piece, which as soon as we're out of lock, as soon as you guys are out of lockdown, everyone's out of lockdown. It's like let's all go dancing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. I'm with you. Yeah, and and like I yeah, I have so much more gender euphoria. I think, especially in the relationships that I have now, than I do dysphoria which is like obviously a privilege in so many ways but you know I think about how I never feel misgendered when I'm holding a kid um, or just like having deeper meaningful relationships where I just like don't have to be 
proving myself in a way that like they already see the multiplicity within me and how relaxing that is. Yeah. Amber, did you have some, some final words? Mm, I love, I love that we're ending this conversation and thinking about joy and think I'm thinking about what, what you, what brings me euphoria and like, I don't, after this, I'm going to go sit outside in the sunshine and just like be in myself. And that is euphoria for me. And I've just loved being in this space with you all today and want to say thank you. Navi, do you have some, some final words? Um, I'm going to have a nap mm. and that's going to be great. Um, but no, feel free to please follow me on social media. I do love having chats and DMs. Um, yeah, no, I'm a storyteller. So maybe I'll see you on a stage near you. Thank you so much for having me on this. Thank you so much. This was so wonderful. I really loved the depth that we were able to go into and everyone's generosity and honesty and just like holding so much complexity and so much nuance, which is very expected of uh, bisexual non-binaries. <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel really grateful to be in this space. There's like a lot, I've done a lot of panels that don't necessarily feel like they've served me. Um, and so it was really nice to actually re-centralize who this was for. And I really hope that everyone who got to watch this um, got that same experience from being in that space with us. Uh, but yeah, I really, I really appreciate everyone's generosity and thank you all so much for being here. Hope you have the most beautiful day and you get to live your bisexual lives to the fullest of their extents. Yeah, thank you all. And thank you so much to the BiPlus community Perth for also putting together this, this event as well. Yeah.